What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about activism and photography. This video is actually going to be part of a two-part series on activism and photography. Originally, I was going to do it all in one video, but I do have three interviews and each interview is going to probably be around 10 to 15 minutes long. So I didn't want to cram three of those into the same video as well as having all of my tips and things that I wanted to say. So <laughs> what we're going to do is divide this up into two videos. Uh, today's video is going to have the interviews and next week's video is going to have my advice and my take on activism in photography. For a little bit of context, I have been photographing protests since around 2018 or 2019 and I've been photographing as many as I can ever since. Every time I attend a protest or a rally or a demonstration, I am bringing my camera. So this is a kind of photography that I am familiar with and that I am interested in and also very interested in talking about how to do it right because there are a lot of disrespectful ways to photograph protests and movements. There's a lot of harmful, actively harmful ways to photograph protests and movements. And so I really wanted to make a video series just kind of addressing that and also giving you guys like the best practices. So how to do it respectfully, how to do it with intent, with emotion, uh, all of that. My first interviewee, her name is Kelly Tatham and she is a member of Extinction Rebellion, which is a environmentalist group that is dedicated to kind of forcing politicians around the world to tell the truth about climate change. So I actually met her at a demonstration at uh, an event in February. We met and I, you know, did my networking thing. Hey, you're a photographer. I'm a photographer. Let's talk. I uh, added each other on Instagram. And then um, the following month, there was another demonstration. And at that point, I had decided that I wanted to make this video. And so shortly after that, I reached out to her and I was like, hey, like, <laughs> would you be interested? And she said, yes. My next interviewee is named Jason Little. Now he shoots in film, which is incredible, um, but he is down in the States. He is a protest and demonstration photographer, though he started as a street photographer. His Instagram feed is a really interesting look into what it looks like on the ground in the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. I reached out to him on Instagram and asked if he would be interested in participating. We had to deal with the time difference a little bit, but um, he agreed, which was awesome. My final interviewee for today's video is named John Goldsmith and he has worked as a photojournalist, has sold his photos to newspapers and has been published. He attends protests and demonstrations in Vancouver, Canada and uh, documents them from a photojournalistic perspective. So I thought that that would be a really interesting um, person to interview for this series because he is not himself an activist. Um, he is not part of the movement. He is simply showing up to document from an outside perspective. And so I thought it would be really interesting to kind of compare and contrast his experiences documenting the movements with the experiences of people who are photographers as well as activists. So without further ado, uh, now that I've interviewed my three guests, I'm just gonna do like one, two, three interviews back to back and then I will be back to say goodbye to you guys and to convince you to smash that like button if you enjoyed the video. Excellent, all right, so here are the interviews. All right. Well, hi, Kelly. Thank you for coming on today. I'm going to ask you a few questions. And uh, if there's anything else that you'd like to let us know or anything else that you want to say during the interview, feel free. Before I begin, if you want to introduce yourself and then plug your socials and just, you know, tell us a little bit about you as a photographer, that would be excellent. Sure thing. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Kelly Tatham. My socials are at Kelly Tatham, although I deactivated my Twitter account yesterday. So we'll see <laughs> how long I stick around. I'm going through like an existential break right now. I'm like, is social media a trap? But <laughs> probably healthy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm a photographer. I'm a writer. I'm a filmmaker. Um, right now I'm living um, on unceded coast sailors territory. I've always been a storyteller and uh, I started working with Extinction Rebellion um, almost two years ago, and that's that was when my first foray into um, protest photography. Um, I only started doing photography about four years ago um, after a journey of being kind of an actor, writer, and then starting to direct my own work, and then going like wanting to get to know more about the camera and uh, having like a full capacity over my artistic output. So that's how I got there. So I guess that was kind of my next question is what got you started with protest photography and uh, how long have you been doing it? And I know you already kind of answered that, but. Well, yeah, so I, the first time I remember going out was in Los Angeles and it was um, fall 2019. And 
Um, I was there because I was I'd become really, really urgently um, concerned about the climate crisis, been concerned about it for some time. But the urgency of it really hit me in summer 2019. And I and I just felt like I have to go out and put my body on the ground and do something about this. And um, so I went to one of my first marches. Um, and that was right before I got involved with Extinction Rebellion. But this was just a march. And uh, there were so many creative signs. And I loved capturing them. And, um, you know, I wasn't even like, I didn't feel comfortable taking pictures of pe people's faces or anything, just the signs. And there was so much movement and creativity in there that it really, it really captured my imagination and, and brought me a lot of joy. That's awesome. Yeah, that's one thing that I love about protest photography from the inside is you just really get that artistic expression right um so i guess you, you mentioned that you didn't want to capture people's faces at first and that kind of leads into my next question which is um what does it mean for you to capture a movement respectfully um you know with empathy for sure i would say that um every action is different right because if it's um like that that first march that i went to in la it was very much tons of people, everyone packed together, you know, lots of media around, everyone taking photos. And it was, you know, no one was putting themselves in a, an arrestable situation. And so even though I didn't take pictures of faces because I was new, I think that in a situation like that, you can kind of look around and like nod at someone and be like, hey, like, which is what I do now. I'm like, is it okay, you know? And then they're <laughs> all, they almost always say yes. Um, and they're, they're, they almost are like, yes, of course, like I'm here for the media, you know, I'm here to put, I made the sign and I want it to be seen. And so you really have to read the room and, and it, and understand the context that you're in because there are other situations where perhaps there's an injunction over the area or, you know, you're directly blocking, um, uh, capitalism, <laughs> you know, being in front of a port or on railroad tracks. And in that case, you, you do not want to capture someone's face unless they've given you explicit consent. So you really have to be aware of where you are, what the context is, and and feel into um, the subject and and get an intuitive sense for yourself. And and as wherever possible, ask for consent. I've only been in situations where I'm like, oh, I don't feel comfortable shooting that person, and so then I just won't. But then sometimes afterwards, I realize I'm like, oh they wanted their picture taken. It was my own discomfort, like, because a lot of these times we're trying to get a message out there. And sometimes we don't feel uncomfortable. Maybe you're in, you know, maybe it's First Nations who are protesting. You're like, that That feels like an extra line that I don't want to cross because like of the context of living on stolen land. Um, in that, those cases, you can just approach people and say like, hey, would you like your photo taken? Like, for even for you, you know, if I'm down there wanting to get the message out, like I don't have to publish these photos myself, I could take photos and send them to someone. Um, because maybe they don't have a photographer around if people are out there with a message, the chances are they're they'll at least welcome the question of being photographed. No, that's a really good. Um, yeah, that that like line between wanting to capture the whole movement, but not wanting to really infringe on on, you know, people who might be vulnerable in that movement. Um, but also not wanting to leave them out of the photographs, obviously, right? Like, no, that's a, that's an interesting point. Um, so do you have any tips for new photographers who are interested in capturing protests and demonstrations, either, you know, activists, dedicated activists who are new to photography or dedicated photographers who are new to activism? Mm. Um, for the dedicated photographers who are new to activism, I think my advice would be just to go for it. Um, there's a lot of I don't want to say misinformation, but not everyone understands what it means to be in an action, especially an arrestable action. For example, the Canberra Street Bridge last weekend, um, some people were asking like, oh, do I like, is it OK if I don't get arrested? Like, can I show up? And it's like, oh, yes, there's so much capacity for you to participate in that space, like 99 percent of it <laughs> without being arrested. And like the, the in these contexts, like obviously I can't speak to every action or any action, but with Extinction Rebellion in particular, like we we set it up and so it's it's a safe space um, to show up and not get arrested specifically, unless it's your choice. And I really want people to know that, like you really have to choose to get arrested in that context. And so just, if you're unsure, just show up, just show up and enjoy it. And um, for activists who wanna get into photography, you know, just go for it. <laughs> like you can use your iPhone, um, you can ask to borrow a friend's phone or a friend's camera um, and uh, 
uh, just have fun with it. It's really like, this is my advice to all people who want to get into photography. Like everybody has an eye, everybody has taste, everybody can capture moments, you know, the technical side takes time and it, I'm still learning it. Um, but I really didn't let that hold me back when I wanted to do it. You know, you just like, Hey, if you're out there shooting on auto, like that's okay. Like, <laughs> you know, you'll do and you'll learn over time, but yeah, just go for it and don't let the fear of like, oh, I'm not going to get this quite right. Or like, oh, I'm not a photographer. Like, if you have a camera in your hands, you're a photographer, go play, have fun. It's really good to mention. Um, so actually, I maybe should have asked you this a little bit earlier, but you've been talking a lot about Extinction Rebellion. And of course, I know what Extinction Rebellion is, because that's how we met. <laughs> but uh, for my viewers, who maybe don't know what Extinction Rebellion is about, um, can you maybe say a few words about what the goals of that movement is? Sure, sure. Yeah, so Extinction Rebellion is a global movement uh, founded, started in the UK, and uh, it's about uh, stopping the climate and ecological crisis, <laughs> halting the emergency um, by uh, demanding uh, a shift in governance from our traditional government structures to citizens assemblies. Uh, we recognize that the way that decisions are being made don't work, and we need to put the decision making power back in the hands of the people. Um, we need to be telling the truth about the, the climate and ecological emergency, uh, and we need to be acting immediately and halting uh, halting emissions and getting them down to net zero by 2025, which um, most governments, uh, their plan is by 2050. And we're saying that is that is far too late, that is far too slow. Obviously the, the movement itself is like full of artistic expression, which lends itself very well to photography, but is also just a really eye-catching and irresistible aspect of the movement. Um, Okay, so I've got one more question for you. And that is, what do you think the photographer's role in the movement is or should be? Ooh, um, well, you know, photographers, image makers are so powerful right now. You know, we're, we're communicating to each other on a screen through images. Um, we stare at I don't know how many thousands of images every day. We're, we're so driven by that. Like that is the narrative. and. Um, I think uh, photographers' roles are, are telling a story, telling a story through these images and capturing, um, I think, the beauty and the humanity and the community um, of the movement. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll say that, the humanity of it, because um, what we're moving through, what we're moving towards requires everyone. I think that the solutions are all based in community. And so... I think that our a photographer's job is to is to inspire people to want them to um, to help them want to be included to know that they're welcomed um, and to yeah to spark that fire to activate yeah that's yeah that's fantastic and I obviously couldn't agree more um, okay well that was my last question do you have any closing thoughts or things that you'd like to share with the audience sure. Um, I would say that uh, the coming years and the coming de decades are are going to be like nothing we've ever seen uh, before, nothing we've ever experienced. And um, a big part of the Extinction Rebellion messaging is no more business as usual, um, because business as usual is killing us. And we're in a very interesting time right now where in most places of the world, hopefully we're transitioning out of this pandemic. <laughs> um, and, you know, here on Coast Salish territory, we're still very much in it and still very much yearning and eager for a return, um, for many wanting a return to normal. Um, but the message being that there is no return to normal, that we're, we're transitioning to something new. And so um, to, to anyone who hasn't stepped in yet or to anyone who's wanting to expand further like know that there's a place for you and know that um that that things are shifting so quickly and by holding each other in community we'll stay stable and um there are no rules anymore you get to play by your own rules now really just um any sort of fear that's coming up telling you need to be a certain way or your life has to look a certain way or you have to prescribe to certain rules like no that's done <laughs> it's done we're, we're centering we're centering our truths and our light and we're taking care of each other and we're we're building an entirely new world i love that and that's yeah i mean obviously the future is terrifying but it's it's exciting that there's people who are looking to change it and embrace it um in positive ways so 
That's awesome. Um, thank you so much again for coming on today. Uh, this was a really good conversation and hopefully there's some other activists out there who are looking to turn photographer or photographers out there who are looking to turn activists because it is a really beautiful movement. So um, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of the day uh, and thanks. Oh, thank you, Yvonne. That was so nice. It was a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Thanks for having me. All right. So first off, if you want to plug your Instagram uh, or any other socials that you have and just kind of introduce yourself, that'd be sweet. Hey, uh, my name's Jason. I'm from New York. I live in Harlem right now. Um, I've been shooting protests well, regularly since last summer, but, you know, I've been doing it a little bit before, uh, mostly street photography before that. And um, so, yeah, that's just what I do on a daily basis. I'm Hal Light Hustle. Um, H a l i d e dot h u s t l e on Instagram. That's my film account. I crazily enough do most of, most of this in film. So that's uh. <laughs> that's, I did not usually, even know that. that. That's usually the you know the 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 icebreaker for people. They'll see me with a film camera, and they'll and they go, "Oh, is that a film camera?" And that mm. just turns into a whole separate uh, conversation. That makes yeah, it's like an object of interest, I guess. That's that's yeah. challenging. I was just saying how hard it must yeah. be to do street photography with film. I can't imagine protest photography where there's just things going on around you everywhere. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I guess my first question for you was, uh, what got you started into protest photography, and how long have you been doing it? I know you already kind of answered that, but yeah. Well, as far as you know, this current string of of work. Um, it was just last summer, you know, last May, starting with the whole George Floyd incident. And I didn't really put much thought into it. I just saw what was happening. And, you know, it was a lot going downtown um, Union Square. And I picked up the camera and went down there. And that, that just set it off. I, I haven't stopped since. And that was what May, I don't know, May 30th, something like that. And mm -hmm. it's been constant. Yeah, I mean, I've seen your work. It seems like you're out every week just taking pictures of what's going on um, and such like a wide range of movements that you've managed to photograph too. Um, so I guess my next question is, what does it mean to you to photograph a movement um, respectfully, like in a way that isn't kind of imposing a photographic perspective on the movement? For me, it's just the humanity of it. That's, that's all I think about. You know, I tell people all the time, I'm not neutral in this. You know, I didn't go out with this sort of mindset that a mainstream photojournalist would have, you know, to just kind of be there and you don't take a side. No, I have a side in this, you know, and I've been very clear about that. But it's just to capture the humanity of it. You know, I wanted people to see that this isn't all broken glass, you know, and that's part of it. You know, mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. I have no problem showing that. but. That's not the bulk of what this is, you know, and I just wanted to show people these are these. Yes, people are upset. People are angry. People are frustrated. But these movements, this movement movement has been overwhelmingly positive and productive. And that's really all I wanted to show, you know. That's awesome. Yeah, that's I am one of the kind of pieces that I wanted to get to in my in my video is the difference between kind of the photojournalist's approach and the actual like activist's approach and and how different those can actually result. Because photojournalists will get crowds and they'll get the mess afterwards, but they don't really get like that human emotion that's actually there when you're when you're part of it. Um, so that's, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, do you have any rules that you follow while shooting, like guidelines or, you know, things that you would really recommend to other photographers looking to get involved in a movement as a, as a photographer? I guess it sounds sort of obvious, but just be aware. Keep your eyes open. You know, you have to you have to look at so much. There's so much going around you. You have to see everything. But again, keep the humanity of the whole thing at the center of what you do. These are real people, you know. And over this time, I've gotten to know so many people. These are good people. You know, these people are like my second family now. You know, I know so many of them. Um, so if you're if you're with this movement all the time, you're going to get to know people. And you're gonna know the stories. How how much of the personal life you know varies on the person, but while you're out there, you know that that is your family. You know, and everybody's close on some level or another. And so, just keep the humanity of it. Look at what's going on. Um, have some empathy. You know, you can shoot with empathy, and 
I think that's the most important thing because the viewer will connect with that. You know, they'll, they'll understand the side of it that's not on the news every night. You know, the news sort of wants to show you the sensational, you know, but there's more to it than that. There's this daily, daily struggle. And when you shoot with empathy, you can show that. And I think people need to see that. It feels like kind of a similar feeling when you're shooting street photography. Um, you're trying to show the individual kind of human life, right? And I guess, yeah, in a protest, yeah. it's that. But you have such a responsibility as a protest photographer to document that in like an accurate way. Yes. So that's super yes. interesting. Yes, Ac yeah, accuracy counts. Yeah. And um, okay, so my next question is kind of along that line. So for new photographers who are just getting started and maybe have been an activist for quite a while and are just now picking up a camera or have been a photographer for quite a while and are just now getting involved in a movement, what pieces of advice or tips would you give them? Well, if you're a photographer and you're gonna become an activist, it's just really about switching mindsets, right? Whatever you've been shooting will help you understand what the people are out there pushing for. So when you decide to get involved on the activist, activist side of it, you should have some understanding of what they're going through, okay? You should have some understanding of what their goals are and all, all that kind of thing. And you can now participate in a, in a constructive way, you know? And so when you switch those roles, if you're an activist wanting to become a photographer, it's the same thing. You you understand what it takes. You understand what the people are out there for. And so when you get behind the camera, you know how to capture, at least you have an idea of where to start on how to capture what everything means. You know, the emotions, the energy of every, you know, every group has a different energy, you know, and you have to be with them on a regular basis to, in order to capture that accurately. But being an activist and switching sides gives you, I think, an advantage in being able to show that. I feel like there's, yeah, a huge place for photographers in the activist circle. Uh, so what moments have stood out to you as a photographer at demonstrations? Because I know there's always like a moment where the crowd parts and there's just this this scene. I'm wondering if you've ever had a moment like that. Oh, man, I just, <laughs> there's been so many. Um, and it's, it feels like it's been, I guess, longer than it has, but there's been so many. Um, you know, I think back to some of the early movements, you know, the early um, protests in the summer where there were literally thousands and thousands of people crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, there was a moment, I think maybe the second or third day of the protest, uh, the, the first time I saw an older man holding a sign asking, am I next? You know, there's just been, you know, so many moments like that, whether you find it in the middle of a protest, whether you come to the end and you just you just kind of think back of the whole thing, and like how, in a way, it's emotionally draining, but at the same time exhilarating to to just think back of how how powerful the whole thing was. You know, you're out for hours, you're out from daylight to nighttime, and a lot happens, but. I, it's just way too many moments for me to single out one or two, even two. Where I just, it's just like a, a trail of, of, of memories that are, you know, permanently stuck in there, you know, and good and bad. They're, they're there, you know, you remember it all. And yeah, I, I, I know that feeling of coming back and like you're emotionally drained, but also like physically drained. And so my, Second, my, or sorry, my last question, I guess, is that I notice a lot of your photography that's like further down in your Instagram feed is all in black and white. And I was wondering if you could like mm -hmm. speak to the utility of capturing protests in like a monochromatic format as opposed to in color. Because it is quite a different vibe. In both. Um, it is. It, sometimes it's just a mood for me. You know, a, every, every now and then I'll feel like, you know, I want to shoot color. But... For the most part, when it comes to this, the black and white just is stark. It's simple. Um, there are no distractions. You know, now some protests I shoot in color specifically because I know they are colorful. They're going to be colorful. You know, um, 
you know, people with the flags and, and, and so forth. But um, in general, that's not what I'm focused on. You know, I just want people to see the imagery, you know, sort of um, something deeper without the distraction of, oh, that's a nice blue or that's a nice green, you know, without that. And so black and white allows me to do that. You know, it's it's a, it's non-distracting. Yeah, more about like the documentary aspect than the, yeah. you know, physical composition or what have you. Yeah. Although the composition right. of your photos is also really good. So, right. um, <laughs> no, yeah, that's that's really interesting. And I haven't shot a lot in black and white myself. But, you yeah, know, after seeing a lot of your protest photos, I'm like, damn, like that seems like a good way to like kind of boil it down to just the emotion and the signs and the people rather than all these distracting yeah. elements. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, that was my last question. Um, thank you again so much. This is like really oh, interesting. It's, really interesting to hear my, from you. My pleasure. Thank you for for bringing me on. I I'm always yeah. happy to talk about this kind of stuff. So no, please. absolutely. Um, and I was just wondering if you have any like closing thoughts or you know advice to other photographers who might be watching this, wanting to get involved. Something. Uh, yeah. If you want to get involved, then just get involved. Just do it. Pick up a camera. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, you don't need anything fancy because this is about people. This is about telling the story. You know, if you have a phone, use that. You know, but if if you really feel the push to get involved, just get involved. Do I say that all the time? Do something. You know, everybody's good at something. Everybody's got their own talents and skills. Um, you don't have to be great. You don't have to take you know, museum quality photos. It doesn't matter. The people on the other side of it will appreciate it. So just do it. Oh, howdy. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on today. Um, I guess my first question for you is if you just want to introduce yourself and then plug any kind of social medias that uh, you have that might give the audience an idea of your photography. Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me, Yvonne. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. Uh, yeah, my name is John Goldsmith, and I've been a photographer for about 20 years, um, doing a lot of art and, and also some professional photography as well on top of that. And my website is johngoldsmithphotography.com, and I also am a professional printer, and that's Printmaker Studio located in Vancouver. What got you started with kind of photojournalism or photographing um, protests or other human events, and what kind of inspired you to get started with that? Um, well, I really have an interest in people, um, and I, I have an interest in photography. And even before photography, I was doing kind of uh, research science, actually, as a chemist. And when I started picking up a camera and, and practicing, I realized that I was sort of studying the world around me. So my science background was kind of coming in, and I was really curious about people and sort of the psychology around people and photography. And the more I went down that line, I, I, mean, I really started like a lot of people um, doing street photography. And that was sort of the art that I was very interested in. And that obviously la lends itself to doing uh, photography like journalism, um, protest photography, or documentation uh, photography. Of, of things, of people, of places, of protests, of um, news, of journalism. So it really was kind of a long process, but I would say over the course of five to 10 years, um, I transitioned from, you know, when you start out and you're photographing all the beautiful things, and then you realize that there's an other kind of uh, story that, that wants to be told. So that's really how I started getting into doing more photographing of people for art and also some photojournalism. That's yeah. See, that's super interesting that you should mention street photography. It really lends itself to protest photography because you're looking out for these spontaneous events happening around you. Um, so, what would you say the main difference between kind of professional photojournalism and just kind of casual street photography would be, both in terms of the end result, but also in like the mental process of creating that image? Well, I mean, to be honest, I think that they're quite similar, um, but. Let me preface that and say that, you know, a lot of people go out and do street photography, and I don't mean this as a slight in any way, um, because I think we all go through this process, whereas you go out to photograph without not a lot in your head in terms of what, um, what you want to photograph. But at some point, you become really curious, or you learn your style, and, or you learn your way of working, how you photograph, who you photograph. 
<clears throat> and you begin to refine that. And as you go deeper down that line, you start to tell, you want to tell a story. And that's when multiple images become more important than that single kind of holy grail um, photograph. You know, instead of thinking, I want to make, you know, one good photograph this year or 10, it's more like, well, what story do I want to tell? And how many photographs do I need to tell that story? And so I think with street photography and also photojournalism, you're using that language of photography. You're, you have a narrative that, that you're speaking to. And I think when you really get into it, you start planning out what your goal is, whether it's with art and street photography and or journalism. So if you're on an assignment for the day, you need to plan ahead. What angles am I going to get? Who do I need to photograph? And ultimately, the big question of what story am I trying to tell? So um, when you're deciding, I guess, when you're coming up with that process of deciding what story you're going to tell, what kinds of considerations go into that? And do you like what kind of prep work goes into that? It's really important um, to think about how the whole event or um, you know protest or whatever it may be is going to go down. Um, and um, there are a myriad of ways where of, of how that can happen. Um, a few years ago, um, when there was a big opening um, actually of the uh, the Trump Hotel and Trump Tower in Vancouver, we talked a little bit about this before, um, had opened up. I was hired along with a, a journalist, a writing, a written journalist, to go um, photograph and document the opening. And so this was a really big event for Vancouver. And, and so I really thought ahead, what would my day look like? And what kinds of shots? do I want to get or what shots might present themselves in the case where I need to be ready. And so for that day, I had a bit of an agenda in terms of where I would need to be or where I would, you know, where I would be allowed to go and who to photograph. But you don't have all of the answers. And when a news story is unfolding, you really don't, you really don't know what's going to happen in some ways. And so you're just trying to prepare your mind and the technology to be allow to allow you to get the the story that you need ultimately. I guess my next question is that do you have any rules when you're out shooting an event like a like a a protest or a demonstration specifically, but you know other kinds of events, parades, whatever as well um, that you follow? Um, not really. Um, basically, I. You know, I have, like I said, I have a way of working. I have my my style, my photography that I'm comfortable with, and and that's what I let guide me. And of course, what is happening on that day, um, and I just go with where I feel like the momentum is. Um, I think it's really important um, to just follow your instincts as a photographer, and then and then and then use that. I, there's no like tried and true way to to get the story. And at the end of the day, with photography in general, I don't think it's really valuable a lot of the times to just go after the killer shot. I mean, we all want that. We all want this amazing photograph that everybody is going to remember for a lifetime. It's on the cover of Time Magazine or Newsweek or something. Of course, we all want that. Um, but but how lucky are we to to have that or how much fortune do we have to get that? And I really think the goal is is narration and narration is using the language of photography which is stitching images together until you can you know describe what you're seeing i don't think i have any rules per se it's really important to be able to do what you want the way you want to but obviously there are times when whatever the story is it dictates a need you know it might just be a portrait of somebody and so you have to decide you know um, at that point, you know, when you're taking the assignment or, or whatever it might be, um, you know, how are you going to get that, that job? But I'll say this, and I'm speaking for other, for, I have another, I have a friend who's a photojournalist and um, she's very talented and um, she gets hired by the New York Times regularly. She hustles. She is, she works hard to get those assignments. And we just had a conversation about this the other day. Because I was telling her, you know, I think of myself as more of an artist than a journalist. And she was like, yeah, 
but I hustle for those jobs. And I think that anybody who wants to get um, hired for, for a newspaper or a freelancer, it's really about, you know, getting your work out there and calling people. That's really good advice. And yeah, that's, um, you know, something that obviously I've been striving to do, but also for anybody watching this, you know, who's interested in photojournalism. Um, I mean, I'd love to talk about that whole era of marketing your photography in the future, but um, no, that's really good advice. One of my last questions for you, what are the physical kind of requirements, not physical requirements, but physical considerations for, you know, you're going to a news event, you don't know how long you're going to be there. You don't know what the conditions are going to look like. What are you bringing? And, uh, you know, what are you keeping in mind? Um, well, you know, what you're bringing really depends on all of those factors of how long you're going to be there, what kinds of photographs are you going to need. Um, I'm, as a street photographer, and really as a, a person, I think um, I like minimalist things. I like, I like complex photographs, but I like working very minimally. So that means a small camera and a small lens. And, and maybe a flash. Um, but obviously, you know, it really depends on what you're doing. So you always have to be prepared and you have to have your battery charger and um, extra batteries and all extra of those Extra memory things. cards. Extra memory cards. And, you know, and just, and bring your wits. And just bring your wits. Like, just be prepared. And you really need to think about ahead of time what you want to get out of this. And maybe some food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I'm going to bars or something, I always keep like a half yeah. a muffin in my bag. So. Yeah, bring two cameras. Um, so I guess, okay, my last question, my real last question this time is, uh, have you ever been at an event where you've experienced hostility? And I'm thinking specifically, like, I've been to an event recently that was like an anti-mask thing, and they mm. hate anybody that they see as press. And so I've got this big long lens, and they see me as press. And so I'm just getting this yeah. like, vitriolic hatred. Like, have you ever experienced something like that? Well, let me just say that that kind of environment's really frightening. And um, I used to say the only kind of photography that I would not do is war photography. Um, because I just have no interest in putting myself in an environment where I'm going to get hurt or die. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a, a friend who does street photography like I do, and he was at um, photographing some essentially drunk people out on the street at night. And one of them took his camera and literally threw it down the street. So things things happen, and um, I don't know that I've. I mean, I've been confronted before um, by people on the streets, by security guards, yeah, by classic. police officers, and I just think it's really important to know your rights as a as a Canadian in this case, or rights as a photographer, and know what. You you know, know how to get out of a tricky situation if you need to. Um, there are certain places that are off limits where you're not allowed to take photography. And it's important to know that if you're on private property, that that could be one of those places. So I don't know that I've ever been in a situation where I felt, you know, in, in immediate harm's way. I have had a subject before get mad at me and threaten me, but I... There were so many people around. I didn't really feel um, I didn't really feel threatened that way. Yeah, I was like, well, um, what are you gonna do? Like, <laughs> yeah, there's well, tons of people. You know, maybe there's a bit of privilege for me that goes a long way along with that as well. I mean, I'm six feet tall. I'm a guy. Um, I'm I'm kind of fortunate in that sense. I guess I'm not too afraid. But there are a lot of people who are smaller than I am, or you know, are in difficult situations, and I just think it's really good to know what the rules are around photography in public spaces. That's a really good point. And that's something that hasn't come up um, yet in any of the interviews that I've done is, you know, yeah, knowing the law, like who can you photograph? Where can you photograph? Cause you know, you've got a lot of freedom, but you've also got certain restrictions and knowing those restrictions is a really good idea at a time. Um, well, awesome. That was all of my questions. Um, do you have any, cool. you know, final thoughts, closing, closing sentiments? <laughs> Um, no, I just, you know, I think going out for people who are interested, <clears throat> for people who are interested in going out there and photographing a uh, protest events, for example, and I wanted to say that, the, you know, the climate out there is really frightening now. Actually, let me just go back quickly. There is a very um, well-known uh, Canadian photographer, and his name is Ben, first name is Ben, 
And he, I know that he had a confrontation with anti-maskers as well. I, it, it's frightening out there. I was going to say that, you know, the war photography sort of idea that I put forth before, it's kind of come home. And and I, I don't know, there's kind of this vitriol out there now. And it's be safe, you know, and know, know the limits. And there's a kind of street photography that's very confrontational also. And I do think that people are a little bit more sensitive now about their own privacy. Mm -hmm. So while you might have the right to photograph anybody you want to out on the streets, just be mindful that other people um, might not be so pleased with that. Mm -hmm. And I, I do say that it's, you know, this is, democracy is built on the idea of free press. And our ability to take photographs is really built into that. But just know that not everybody agrees with, with you. Um, but photography is a wonderful thing. And it's really important that we document these these festivals, these protests and these events and, and so forth. But it's really important to know what your limits are and what the law is also. So, but yeah, photography is amazing. So just get out there and take more pictures. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview. Lots of things to keep in mind. Yeah, awesome. Thank you again. All right, so I hope that you guys enjoyed that. I hope that you found it educational and informative. If you are planning on going out and photographing a, a protest or a rally, I really, really hope that you take some of the things that you heard in this video into consideration. You know, if you're an activist who's looking to pick up a camera, I absolutely encourage you to do that, like absolutely do it, but do be cognizant of how you are photographing the movement that you are being a part of, you're participating in. And uh, you know, if you're interested in this topic, I'm gonna be back next week to share with you some of my own experiences as a protest photographer, some of my own pieces of advice, and some pieces of advice that I've gotten in doing my research for this series. So, <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching. I'm excited to be talking to you guys about this next week. And uh, in the meantime, stay sharp, and don't forget to keep shooting. <laughs> <laughs>